sound off on that. But otherwise, uh, we, we, we are live. Yeah, you'll find out soon enough because it'll start echoing back to you. Um, I'm going to wait till I actually can see the screen in the YouTube session. Oh, there it goes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're calling from. My name is Charles Sterling. I actually do these on a regular basis, so you probably know me. And I've got a very special blast from the past, as I call him, uh, Jeff Gray. Jeff Gray and me have been working for quite a while. Um, th that's not insinuating that you're old, Jeff. That's not the intent here, but we are. And um, yeah, and we've been working on developer products, specifically around test automation. How do you actually put your testing uh, regime into a CI CD pipeline working, making it work DevOps and still going out and proving that you got scale. So it's kind of cool. Um, and now that I've been in the Power BI business and I've been asked a couple of times, how do you actually go out and load test or make sure that the capacity of your reports is up to what you actually want to service. And it's a hard problem. And the reason it's hard is because we actually use OAuth and it's a very secure platform, which makes test automation very, very difficult. So I went back to my old buddy, Jeff, who actually I knew made it work with uh, SharePoint. It's actually the first time I think I heard you getting that working. It was you that did SharePoint, right? For Dennis Bass? Uh, SharePoint, O365, Power BI, um, CRM Online, a few yeah. of them. So yeah, I reached out to the guy that I knew could make it work and said, hey, can you walk through the process that you use to actually get that working? Um, so uh, Jeff, can I get you to share your screen? I, as much as we love looking at you, we're, we're, we're not gonna do that all day. And what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna walk through, I think three different um, demos or three different phases in this. The first one is, is just going to go ahead and show Visual Studio load testing and show how it was intended to um, uh, to work back with Sean Lenley and Ed Glass. And what would that be, 10 years ago? Uh, actually, over 10 years ago now. God. 2005. 2005, yeah. Was the first edition of this, yep. And, and just to double check, can everybody see my screen OK? Or at least, yeah. Charles, can you see it? We, we can. I can see it both in the Hangout session and I can see it on the YouTube. So I can, we definitely got it working well on both. Um, and we're going to go out and show what the creators intended to work like. Back then, we didn't actually have to worry about a lot of the OAuth and this sort of uh, functionality. So we're going to go out and do a quick load test recording and we'll show it playing back. And then we're going to show why it's hard to get it working in an OAuth environment. And then we're going to actually have Jeff walk us through what he does to actually make that work and then actually automate that. So Jeff, I'm going to hand it over to you. And since we can see the microphone, I want you to start by introducing yourself, telling us where you're from and what you're doing right now. Oh, because oh, you have to back up and tell us what how we work together as well. Uh, what team were you on? I okay, I, Jeff Gray. I have uh, I'm a former employee of Microsoft. Worked there for 24 years, and last year started my own consulting company. Prior to doing that, I spent the last 11 years working on the um, Microsoft Testing Services Labs performance test team. I uh, worked with Charles through a lot of interaction with the product team and dev team and uh, through various different uh, customer facing engagements and so on. Uh, as far as working with this, I have worked with Visual Studio web and load testing since version 2005. I've got uh, a ship at award for Visual Studio load and web testing 2008 SP1 as well as Visual Studio 2010 and uh, continue to do a lot of work with it. And it's kind of my passion. So I uh, also want to let people know right up front, uh, we are encouraging this to be an open session. So if you have questions, Charles will be moderating them. And some questions we'll take and answer immediately during the presentation. And other ones we'll hold off till towards the end if it makes more sense to get into that more in depth later on. But either way, we'll try and get through with that. So with that, um, let me kill this heads up because I don't want Visual Studio to restart or Windows to restart right now. <laughs> Gotta love Windows. So I've got a uh, Visual Studio web and load test project. And if I want to add a new test, I just right click, choose add and web performance test. I ignore this screen. Normally, you wouldn't see this screen. This is something we're going to be showing you later on. So I'm going to disable any plugins. And now I get my browser up ready to start recording. 
because nowadays OAuth and other types of authentication and cookies and everything else are so prevalent in websites, the best thing to do is to start an in-private browsing session. Visual Studio will automatically pick up the recordings from multiple browsers, anything that is open. So if I start a new browsing session, and just so you can see, I've got the main session open behind the in-private session, and you'll see the steps that I'm doing show up in both windows. I'm going to go to powerbi.com. And in just a second, you'll see the requests start to show up. And so you can see they're in both windows now to complete this. I'm going to go full screen and I'm still going to have to go to the uh, menu and choose partners. And I'll wait for this to finish. Let's see if it's actually shown up now. Looks like it has. So I'll stop the test. Immediately, Visual Studio will start the playback, and it goes through attempting to detect dynamic parameters. And let's see how far it can get with playing this back. Now, it picks up a lot of requests, both from the application that you're on and what we call off-box inclusive calls, which are to third-party calls and other things. Um, so every once in a while, we see that some of those third-party calls are not working properly. Notice that the test says that in the playback it failed. So I will go back to the um, playback. I'm going to find out what requests failed. Let's scroll down here. And notice that we've got a call to a third party uh, website. I don't even know what site that is, but I'll go to the web test and I'll delete it. And then I'll continue up here and I'll find that Everest Tech called to ads.yahoo and then tube mongol and everest tech so again um if i go to the web test so what's happening there is we've got some telemetry wired up and then those services are actually calling out to somebody else that's actually not even there is is that is that right jeff yeah yeah has nothing to do with power bi as a matter of fact it's probably something to do with advertising, most websites make some sort of money off of advertising, which requires them to go back to third party. And of course, the telemetry, which tells you what's really going on uh, with the site usage, but they don't impact your site itself. So once I've removed those, let's play it back again. And we should get through and see that the test passes. So, these were the good old days when a test was fairly simple. You could add a couple things here or there, but for the most part, notice now that the test passed. If I wanted to load it up, I could throw this into a load test and just run it and generate a fair amount of load. So that's our first demo. And we'll go ahead. Let me just ask really quickly, Charles, you can see the window. Does anybody have any questions about this first demo? and just the, the idea that we're making a simple test. Uh, you, not not related to what you're talking about. There's a couple of people asking about source control of the PBIX files. We haven't actually um, published the format, so we actually don't have great source control at the, at the asset level, like the code and whatnot. So it's actually, they're just binary files to our version control, but nothing to do with you. To, to the now, when you say source control to the PBIX for mm -hmm. oh for the Power Builder or Power BI stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. We've got, yeah. yeah, we've got a model language, we've got DAX language, we have the visuals themselves, and those of course are actually contained in a zip file that's all over the place, and we haven't actually published that, so the version control systems can't actually go out and figure out what what individual updates there were. But you bring up a good point that I do want to talk about from a web and load test project standpoint. Web tests and load tests are completely source controlled. As a matter of fact, you can see that I had, should have this where I could check it in. I'm not going to right now, but I've got this entire project in source code in source control, so the, the web test can. I do want to point out, we've got a feature that automatically parameterizes web servers. I'm going to bring this up right now because I want you to see how many calls are being made just by going to the Power BI site. This is a quick way to see. We go to Power BI, 
But then we go to all of these other sites. Now, the Power BI CDN, that's our content delivery network. So that's, those are edge servers. Um, PowerBI.Microsoft.com, which is part of the um, authentication authorization set up. But a bunch of third-party sites that we go to. And that's something you need to keep in mind also. Yeah, and this is actually missing some. I, I, I'm i looking at this list. I know I call out to ideas.powerbi.com. I don't see that in here. Um, I also call out to the Visual Studio telemetry, the, the DC endpoint. That's missing. You, so. you, you do. And I'll yeah. tell you why those are missing. They're missing because nobody's logged in. Uh, they, those, yeah, calls, yeah, yeah, yeah. those calls don't mean anything without a login. So we'll actually see those come up when we do the next demo. That is Good. a great segue. So let's go ahead and close this up. And incidentally, I'll just rename this real quick. So this is Power BI Partners. And I'll go ahead and add a new web test. Again, I'm going to disable the plugin. And again, I am going to start in private browsing. And I will go to, I'm going to, do something else, and this is common for me to normally do, is add a lot of comments. Anybody that's seen me work with web tests, the comments are really critical because they help you understand where you are at the website. So I'm going to the home page. So I'll type in Power BI. And we'll give it a minute to finish populating. It can be a little slow sometimes. There we go, it's starting to fill in a little bit more now. Let's see if it's got it all. Well, it's close enough. So um, my next step is to click on the sign in button. I'll just say sign in and I'll go here and I'll click on sign in. Okay, and it takes me to the sign in page. So I'll add another comment that says uh, username. And this challenge response that you're seeing right here, guys, this is why you can't use a web only author or test authoring tool like Selenium, because it actually can't see this dialog box, which is actually popped up by Windows. So this is the challenge response from that OAuth um, uh, exchange, and Selenium cannot echo those credentials here. So anyways, this is Jeff, I'm sorry good. to interrupt. That's quite all right. That's good to know. And of course, the next step is the password and go ahead and, and take a note of what my password is because it will be changed by the end of this um, session because I'm going to need to reveal this password to you guys in the plugin. So next I get a pop up that says stay signed in. Now this is again, this is a, something where we can have multiple choices. So I just add a comment that stay signed in. And then I do question mark equals yes. And that tells me that for this pop-up, I chose to stay signed in. And now it's gone through and you can see that I have got a bunch of other requests showing up here. So that's far enough for me to, to show you what we need to do. So I always end with um, a couple extra comments and then I hit stop. And Visual Studio will take over again, and it's going to attempt to de detect dynamic parameters. And sometimes this could take a little while because Visual Studio, in doing the dynamic parameter detection, it plays back the web test. And then it compares the playback version of the web test to a recorded version of the web test. And it's looking at all of the different parameters and contexts and other things that may be passed in or are through the test. And it's looking for any items that have changed and says, well, if these have changed, they must be dynamic somehow. Let me try and automate the extraction of them. Well, in order to do that, if you stop and think generically, there's a lot of processing going on here. So it can take a little while for this to work. I do want to let it finish. Uh, I do also want to point out that we'll be doing a lot of the same type of stuff with the plugin that I'll be showing you later on, but it's a lot faster because it doesn't need to be generic and cover every single request and every single response. 
where Visual Studio is building these huge lists of all of the uh, headers and query string parameters and form post parameters and hidden fields and hidden parameters, and then going through and walking every single request in two different tests, doing all this comparison to it. Um, personally, I think it would be a good place to maybe move, move this into machine learning into the AI cloud, but um, you know, that's something that uh, I'll have to take up with the product team soon. You know, if we if we just had them supply a add in for OWASP scenarios, I would be happy with that. I, I'll wait these minutes for actually to detect it all um, statically. Anyways, so what are we looking at here, Jeff? Okay, so when we did the test, these are items that it found that it said, "Hey, these things could be dynamic." So it says, "I found something that was called client request ID." It says it looks like it found it in the response to authorize. And it looks like it's being used in this telemetry request. So it says, I'm going to add an extraction rule to this authorized request. I'm going to make the context called client request ID, and I'm going to bind that to this telemetry request. And here are all the items that it found. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine items that it found. So that's a good start, but there's a long ways to go. Now, we see again that the test failed, 15 primary requests failed. So let's go back and look at our results and see why it failed. So we'll scroll down and we get to the first one. Well, look at there. Does that look familiar? That's our good old everesttech.net, which we don't need. So we're gonna have a few of these things. How about I just go ahead and get rid of these things? So I'll come back up here. I don't want any of my edge calls, so I'll get rid of all of those. Nav DMP, I'm going to get rid of. And again, any of the ones I'm deleting right now are third party. They're not part of the Power BI site. So I'm just going through and deleting them. And of course, I'm good at this because I've done it so many times over the last few days. Normally, I would work a little bit slower. Uh, Charles, there's your call to Optimizely. Um, Yep, there's our A-B testing. We're actually going to probably yep. put that in more places. I want to run okay. By the way, the web the web dev team is actually on my team, so I get to sit with these guys on a regular basis. So obviously app.powerbi.com is important, and the Vortex data is not and is not. Telemetry is not important. There's my username. Here's my password. Let's see if there's anything. So the password, KMSI and app.powerbi, those are important. I'll delete this one. Now, I'll call this one out .eot. That's a web font. Um, I don't need that, so I will get rid of it. Any call that I see to WABI US East 2 redirect is a call that's part of Power BI. I need to keep those. I'll explain later on how I know that, but just trust me for the moment. So I'm going to leave those in. This is a call to visualstudio.com where we're actually using uh, App Insights. So it's making that App Insights call to Visual Studio. That's right. We, we do our perf monitoring that way. Yep. So another font and another um, perf mon. And now all the rest of it is YBEs too. So now what I'm left with after cleaning all this stuff up is a much shorter test. Okay. Now let's try running it again and see how it does. Bunch of stuff failed again. Now, one of the things you can do to work through this stuff is you can go to the web test and change one of the settings. If you highlight the web test itself and go to the properties, change the stop on error from false to true. Then when you play the web test, as soon as it hits its first failure, it'll stop. The reason this is valuable is because nine times out of 10, when it stops on a failure, most of the other requests will likely fail as well because it needed to get something out of it. 
That said, once you're done debugging with my team, you'll definitely want to turn it back on because we will send back a bunch of HTML broken tags. Okay. And so we should leave it off, and then you should send that back as bugs to the product team to tell them <laughs> to get rid of <laughs> Once they get done with the accessibility and the GDPR stuff, we'll, we'll, we'll get on yep. top of that. I actually, uh, another guy on the team, Robert George, uh, was famous for a plugin he wrote that just threw exceptions on every 404, and the exceptions were captured and written out to a log file, and then he would just have the log file automatically mailed to the product team. Nice. And that was that was a way of of again, this is just more value add that you can get out of these web tests, um, and it's good to know that. Now, in this case, we're getting invalid URI, which this one's going to be kind of complicated. I want to show you how I want to, to try and figure this out. Okay. So my failure happened on a redirect from app.powerbi.com. I can go to the recorded result of the test. Let me get rid of Solution Explorer and let me split my screen. And hopefully, let's go here. This is after password. So I'll scroll down here to password and here is the the original request and here is the request that I was recorded and given back to me. Notice if I look at the requests, it's got a bunch of form post parameters and it's got those same form post parameters. But let me ask you some ID token and session state What's the likelihood that those items are going to stay the same? 100%, Jeff. They'll never change, yeah. ever. Yeah, no. <laughs> they shouldn't. They should never change. Yeah, exactly. So if I go to the password, though, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to look at the form post parameters. I'm sorry. That was Yeah, that was the form post, but it was actually not for that call. It was for... Um, This one, I'm sorry, let's pull this one up. Form post parameters. Well, look at there, it's actually pulling those values out. So something else must be wrong. If I look at the headers, I've only got the refer. All of this stuff makes this one look like it should work. So technically, this should be working, but for whatever reason, it's not. And actually, if I look here, Notice that it's redirecting to itself without adding this no sign up check. So the best thing to do in this case is I'm going to need to modify this so that it does not follow redirects. So if I go to the web test. And how, and did, you bring, figure, how did you figure out that the first time? Just because you've done this a while? Uh, yeah, I, honestly, this one, I I don't remember exactly what all I did with this one, but this was one that took me a little while to figure out. Um, and I think also part of it had to do with this, to stay signed in equals yes. So uh, because if I change that, it still works. It could also have been one of the, the previous requests. I'm kind of running through these requests fairly quickly right mm -hmm. now. No, I understand. And so to that aspect, it could be that I'm actually missing something here. If I look, these all look like they're well parameterized. So everything should be good there. Um, so again, this is just one of those ones where the best thing to do is go to the properties, and tell it to not follow redirects. Okay. Let's save that. And let's see now, I'll close this window and this window, and let's play it back again. And let's see if we get further. Okay. So we got past that, and now we get down into this redirect analytics. And let's see what the failure is. It's a 403 forbidden. So that's going to be an issue with permissions of some type. So let's look at that request. And this is the getting started status. I'll bring up the same thing over here. 
and this is and incidentally notice i want you to notice that i've got two getting started statuses if i've got this getting started status call it is of type options you can look here and see that the type is options down here i've got a getting started status and this is a post my options did not fail my post failed so i need to do some comparison here well the very first thing that strikes me is authorization. I've got an OAuth bearer token. Now, how do I know this? Because I've done OAuth before. This is just one of those ones you have to know and take on faith. The next two I notice are not there, activity ID and request ID. Those are not part of OAuth. Those are part of Power BI. I'm going to guess that they're part of Power BI's session state because they're managing the session activity and the request activity anyway none of those show up so that's going to be a problem we're going to need to find a way to extract these values know where we can get the values and then add the values into the test so there's another item that we'd need to fix i don't want to spend the time to go in actually fixing these right now because you'll see that there's actually a lot of changes that need to be made to do this manually but you get the idea that you have to go through manually looking at the recorded response, the playback response, and you need to know a little bit about the application itself and any of the underlying architecture the application is using. So you can see here that we have discovered a number of items that really need to be handled or taken care of in order to get this working properly. The next thing I want to show you is how we can use a plugin to automate this. So before I show you the plugin, though, any questions at this point with what we've looked at so far? No, I think we're good. Uh, we're, I, let me go back and look at it, but I think we want to continue. Okay. Just to let everybody know, there's plenty of documentation um, up on the Microsoft site. There's also documentation and a lot of good information and articles up on um, uh, Stack Overflow and uh, so on. So there's, there's options you can use to take a look at this stuff. So first thing I wanna do is show you a generic recorder plugin. And let me zoom in the code here a little bit. Basically to create a recorder plugin, we just create a class that is based off a web test recorder plugin. And then we override one of two event handlers, post web test recording or post web test dynamic parameter detection. Post web test recording will execute after you hit the stop button when you're recording, but before Visual Studio detects dynamic parameters. Post dynamic parameter detection will execute after the dynamic parameter detection has completed. So you could choose either one of those. Because this is an add-in for Visual Studio, it loads in the DevM Visual Studio space. So if you want to debug it, you actually have to have this system diagnostics.debugger.launch in order to be able to do the debugging of it. So I just leave it sitting in here, comment it out so that it's ready for me whenever I need it. So all I would do to do some plug-in work here is I would create a method in this class that says perform whatever walkthrough and in that walkthrough i would handle each of the items that i know need to be handled so this is just the generic format for these let me go over here to solution explorer and i'm going to open up what i've already created i'm going to start with an xml file and i want to show you essentially all the different things that I'll be doing to get this to work properly. First of all, there are going to be some random 404 requests that show up. I'm going to automatically remove those. I'm going to set my stop on error to true. So I'm going to automatically change that at the test level. I've got some things for adding comments or summary comments and so set pre-authentication. But then I've got a list of items, unwanted items. These are all of the things that you saw that showed up. 
I'm going to have it automatically remove all those for me. So I don't have to worry about doing that. Unwanted pages, a little bit different than unwanted items. The unwanted pages look specifically for items that end with a certain uh, set of text. So any request that ends with .eot or .json, I'm going to remove those as well because, again, we don't need those. Then malformed items. We do run across in some cases, and I added this up because Charles ran into this when he was testing in his environment, and it turns out that the, the problem doesn't exist on core Power BI, but will soon exist when a new version comes out. And you'll end up getting requests where the response on the request is cannot send a content body with this verb type. And they're essentially sending form post parameters with a type of get. It's a bug in the Visual Studio web test recorder, not the plugin, but the recorder itself and the way it handles those certain requests coming through IE. So I added an item here just to handle those. Extract text items. I created a bunch of extraction rules automatically already. So we saw client request ID earlier needed to be parameterized. So here's client request ID. I'm going to get that from app.powerbi.com. Hey, Jeff, I, I apologize. I'm going to interrupt just yeah. for a second. Did you show in a web test how you could have done this manually? Um, I was actually looking at the Q&A window, and you may have done that. But in the q I, I did not. If I want to show how I would do that manually, let me go back and open up web test 2. Yeah, if you could. And I'll open up my test results, okay? And I'm going to need to find out what, let me bring up my recorded results. And I'm going to go down to where, sign in, sign in, username, password, right here. Um, and no, it wasn't that one. Which was it? Um, Oh, I need to find out where it was used. Right here, here we go. Okay, so the way I can add this is, I'm sorry, it wasn't that, it was client request ID, and that mm -hmm. was this item. That's right. Okay, okay, so if I do request ID, I can do a quick find, I can search up, find next, and notice that it highlighted the request window, I want to keep searching till I find it highlighting the response window, which it does not. Um, so I'm going to go back to um, try it with the auth token instead, because I know that one will work. So I'll do a quick find, search up, find next. Hey, the word not. bear, remove the word bear. I don't think it actually exists in the initial that response. That is correct. That is correct. So E Y J O E X. I had to do this the old fashioned way. <laughs> Sorry about this. But it's it's nope. important to, for people to know, I think, that it, oh, come on, guys. It was there. Uh, I know. I know. I, again, I think that, um, There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right. So now here's what I can do. Here's what I, I want to find. If I want to add an extraction rule, I'm going to copy this because that's what my extraction rule starts with. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go up to here, go to web test. It should highlight, and of course it didn't. Um, it should highlight this request. I'm going to add extraction rule. It's going to be of type extract text. And it's going to start with, just copied, it's going to end with that end tick. And I'm going to put it into a token. So guys, this is what his uh, Jeff's add-in is, is automating. So you could actually do this manually. You could go out and find where you actually got those tokens because it's actually going to shove it in the header all the way through. All those obby US East from there on in actually are going to need to have that um, inserted back in. So he would actually now go out and insert 
a, a value of that of that parameter. Um, this is what I'm doing right now. And here's the kicker is that it, you can't normally I would just go pick it from here because it automatically recognizes that I added it. But as Charles rightly pointed out, I have to manually add it because it requires that bearer in front of it. Why did it not? Uh, you you keystroked right over the top of it. Your carrot moved over to the beginning. It, that, may, it. that may have been a Google issue. Well, that could also have been um, my touchpad. So basically now, when I get down here, I am now extracting it from this request and I'm adding it to this request. Now I'm gonna have to go through and find out every other place that it does that. So, be um, so before Jeff writes his add-ins, he does this manually to get them to replay. Once he actually sees what was required as far as extract, insert, extract, insert, then he goes out and automates that. Is that fair? Is that yeah, your, your process? That's okay. Exactly good. it. That's exactly it. I have to manually build the process and figure out what items to set up. And so then once I've done that, so for instance, um, instead of showing you client request ID, let me see if I can find um, auth token in here somewhere. I've got it in here somewhere. Here it is. Okay. So here's where I'm saying I need to handle auth token. I'm adding extract text rule. It's going to be extract from powerbi.com. It's going to be added into auth token. Notice that I've already got my starts with and I've got my ends with and all of the other uh, items that I need for the extract text. So it turns out I've got nine, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of these extract text items that need to be added throughout the test. Okay. Missing headers to add. Notice on the, the test, if I go back to the web test, I had to add this header in to this getting started status. So if I go to my headers, um, and I'll scroll down here a little bit, um, and I should probably just search for it, but I'm crazy that way in that I don't. Um, get user status should be right, oh, getting started status right here. So if I have a getting started status of type post, I'm going to add the origin. I'm going to add the request ID. And here is my add of authorization bearer auth token. So it turns out that just adding that one header isn't enough. I also need to add the request ID. I need to add the origin. So I've gone ahead and set this up so that it'll do all of those for me. And this list contains 26 different request types that all need to have that handed to them. So how much, how much of that is specific for Power BI and how much of it is just an OAuth SaaS service sort of paradigm? Good question. I, the authorization is going to be the uh, OAuth paradigm. Mm -hmm. The origin request ID is going to be a couple of them. I think that that seems to be fairly typical, not necessarily because of OAuth, but because of workflows that a lot of Microsoft apps have. Because of the data um, centers and the SaaS service paradigm. Yeah, right? I, yeah. I, I, I'm guessing. But I just know that if I add those here, it works. And the easiest way to tell is to go back to the recorded web test. And if I go back down to this getting started status, and I've got post, I can see what was added. Origin was added. Activity ID was added. Request ID was added. Authorization was added. So I just know that all these get added. Now, somebody might have noticed that request ID wasn't in there. And the reason request ID is not showing up in there is because request ID is a unique GUID that's sent for every single request. So I handle that in a totally different manner. So that was another discovery that I made that I, I found a, a different way to handle it. So uh, anyway, so those are our, our missing header info. Let me collapse that. And then context parameters to add. I'm just 
parameterizing the five main web servers. And again, that's just good habit. Then I'm parameterizing the username and the password. Okay. Now, having shown you all of that, if I go back to my main uh, plugin, let me show you my main iterators. Walk the initial recording, remove 404 requests, remove unwanted requests, add context parameters, add a new GUID web test plugin. This plugin is what's going to generate new GUIDs for me. Add all my extraction rules, parameterize activity ID. Those are very specific. Parameterize values. Those are any item that I found that wasn't an activity ID. Parse for missing headers. That's what adds the extra headers. Uh, don't worry about what all I've done with all of this. This code will be made available to you guys. This is all sample code. It, it comes complete with our famous provided is without warranty, but you're welcome to use it and get an idea of what you need to do with that. But um, so without going into any more of the details of it right now, let me show you what we would normally do is we would build this project and I've already built the project. I would take the output from that project. So let me go to my documents and show you Visual Studio 2017 projects. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's not where I kept it. It's on my source here, Power BI recorder plugin, recorder plugin, bin, debug. This is the uh, output from building that recorder plugin. I copy that and then I go to documents, Visual Studio 2017, and I create a web test plugins folder and paste it there. This is documented on the web. So just so you know, you're going to wherever you've got Visual Studio 2017 installed, web test plugins, and just pasting it right there. This log file is what gets created every time I create a new test. So I'm going to delete that. I'm going to go back into Visual Studio. Matter of fact, I'm going to close all of these windows. And then I'm going to create a brand new web test. So I'm going to choose Add Web Performance Test. And this time, here's my sample recorder plugin to show some possible cleanup of Power BI web tests, I leave it checked. I say, okay, nothing looks different now. So I open up a new in private browsing. I go to the home page. We'll wait for that to come up. And there it goes. Then I add a blank comment and I add my sign in. Go here and I click on sign in. Blank comment and then username. And then I'm going to add my password comment. And see if I can remember this password. Uh, P E E at uh, I S. Yeah. <laughs> Don't ask me why I did it so complicated. So stay signed in. Uh, question mark equals yes. I'm going to take it a little bit further than I have before. At this point, we have now gotten to the core. Power BI page, but I want to take it a step further. So um, I'll add a blank comment and then I'm going to say I want to open a workspace. So I have got over here under workspaces a Power Demos workspace. So I choose that and then I'm going to open the airplane dashboard. So I'm just putting in a comment that I want to open the dashboard. I'll choose on the airplane dashboard or airline dashboard, and you can see that this dashboard has shown up. 
Okay, so now this is done. I'm just going to end it like I always do with a couple extra comments. And then I'm going to say stop. To give you an idea of the time frame, it has already finished all the work on my recorder plugin. So that's how much faster my plugin is than the the built-in one. And if you look at the, the test, you can already see that it's created a cluster URI context parameter, and that cluster URI is mapped to whatever data center you're set for. Here's all of our standard requests that we saw last time that it wants to add these um, particular tokens to. So I'll say OK. And if you notice, the test passed. So let's go look at the results. You can see that everything passed here. And if I go to the web test, let me show you what it looks like now. Let me just uh, collapse a couple of these requests that Visual Studio automatically expanded. There it is. That's your entire web test already cleaned up. You can see that it added all these context parameters. It created a couple of different um, uh, good plugins that work a little bit differently for each one. If I go over to my um, password, you can see that it's got its own built-in form post parameter extractions. And then it's got some of mine. Nope, those are still its extraction rules. Here are my extraction rules. Cluster URI, auth token, and activity ID. If I go to my getting started and I look at the headers, you can see that it has already added the activity ID and it figured out which activity ID it was. It's got the request ID and it's also got the authorization barrel. Now, one other thing I didn't show you that I want to point out is if I go to username, get credential type. Notice here that it's got a string body. And if I go to the properties of the string body, notice that it's actually parameter parameterized the items inside the string body as well. That's something that the code I've got does that a standard find and replace or search and replace will not do. Even if you open up the web test, which is just a pure XML file in Notepad and do a find and replace, it'll do everything but string bodies because those are actually XML encoded or URL encoded. No, I'm sorry, by, uh, base64 encoded inside the XML. So you, you have to open that up to get to it, but the plugin will do that for you. So now if I change the username to somebody else's username and password, it should work. So the idea is to understand your app, learn how to troubleshoot your app and walk through the steps to figure out what's wrong with it and then figure out what of those items can be automated and then set up automation for it. Um, you'll find that as you drill in with your own applications, that you'll start building a library of utilities that you can use to work on this. Um, as an example, just quickly, let me show you. This is the log file. So we removed 34 requests. We added seven contexts. We added a plugin. We added nine extract text rules. We found three unique activity IDs. We parameterized 92 other values. We added 17 activity IDs and parameterized all 17 of them. Um, and apparently have got a bug in the counter for that, because I know it added some more than that. Um, but as an idea of the reuse of this stuff, the logger that I used to write all this information out is a generic logger that I wrote a long time ago. The item that I used here for called web test replacer is again another utility that I wrote. This is what utilizes, uh, or I'm sorry, this is what opens up the string bodies and the 
uh, header names and the header values and the query string headers and the query string values and allows you to specify what do you want to change. So again, tackle any writing of these plugins as I'm building a toolbox or a tool set that I can continue to use. And then all the work you're doing is not going to just apply to one test. It's going to apply to all the tests as you continue going. And that's the standard part of doing any type of good continuous testing with DevOps is to ensure that the people that are doing the testing are aware of the changes that are made and that the test harness starts off working. And then you maintain the test harnesses, you maintain changes to the application. And the idea and the way this was built was with that in mind that I can continue to grow and expand this plugin as Power BI expands. At this point, I want to stop and, and open up for questions. Uh, we've got about nine minutes left, it looks like. So I want to turn it over and see what questions we have. You know, we only actually have one from Philip Spokus. Um, and his is a very general, uh, almost meta question, which is, this is all good stuff. But at the end, I'm just putting a uh, load on Power BI. Assume this is to load test on either embedded or premium resources. Is there another purpose? Um, yeah, ahead. so so actually there's a couple of things with this. First of all, um, this is designed specifically for Power BI Premium. Um, and yes, it does allow me to put a load on Power BI Premium. And what I'm showing you here is the bulk of being able to get a web test started in Power BI. And then when I start adding, let's say that I build a report that has 12 different dashboards and two of the dashboards have five different pages and each page has got a bunch of different uh, artifacts on it. I'm gonna to wanna to be able to test all of that. Well, this plugin theoretically is the starting point for being able to do all that. And then I can get performance metrics on all of that um, and find out how long it takes to show stuff. So, you know, really quickly, if I just go here and I choose to add a uh, transaction timer, um, I can easily with this have it grab all of the items that are just part of that one dashboard. And then if I embed this web test in a load test, even if I run a single iteration, I will have a timer that says dashboard took this long. And so if I open five different dashboards in this load test, I can see how long each one of them took as a load test result set. Not only that, but then when the next rev comes out, I can run that exact same test again. And because it's in load test result set, I can compare how long each one of those dashboards took to load and see, is it getting slower or is it getting faster or is it staying the same? So it's not only being able to see under load, as I add load, how much does it slow down, but it can also be used for performance testing on single user level, unit performance testing, and can be expanded. That's exactly right. So performance over time. If we're going out and, and doing ALM workflows where you're doing updates into workspace A and then you're cloning it out into your production workspace, um, you can go out and test it every single time and say, are we getting faster? Are we getting slower? And is that important to you? Is it worth the cost, uh, knowing that up front? And of course, the worst case scenario or best case scenario would be, hey, I we lost a page. We went out and we did some updates. I did a deployment. We ran the, uh, I don't want to use the word load test here. I ran the performance test across it and the performance was up, but we were missing three pages. So, you know, that's almost availability test. By the way, Application Insights uses all of these tests that Jeff was just showing as their availability tests. Now, of course, they don't support add-ins. So you'd actually have to go back to that very first metaphor of hand extracting and actually going back out and hand concatenating those packets back in. Um, they were talking about going out and marking other types of tests as availability tests. They haven't actually done that work yet. So, Phil, I hope that's a super in-depth answer to the question you're asking. Um, oh yeah, he says it makes perfect sense. So it's based on perf test beyond load. So it's actually perf and availability and finally load 
almost as a separate workflow. Um, and you get to reuse the same assets in three different places. So, uh, it, looks like, it looks like when I tried to toss this one into load, for some reason it had an issue with it. So I, and that, I guess that doesn't surprise me, but, um, and it didn't get far enough in to get the transaction timer. But the idea is now I would troubleshoot this and I would have a way of going in and just seeing those transaction times from that web test. Um, so I didn't see him go through the wizard, but it would have asked him how many users um, across what yeah. cores and what from what geographies. That's also important. Um, I, I can't talk about some of the features that we're releasing, but having geo distributed uh, tests coming in from different parts of the world is going to be very important to Power BI people in the near future. And let me let me wrap up by putting it this way. One of the things I think that is most overlooked with Visual Studio Web and load testing is the ability to use web tests for integration tests, for unit tests, for unit performance tests, for validation tests, and for user acceptance tests. Um, because everybody looks at dot web tests as this is what I throw into a load test for doing performance. And you can't, and it does an amazing job with that. However, it does all the other stuff just as well if you start looking at this as a really powerful tool in your toolkit. So you've got all kinds of options with web tests and load tests. The idea with what we looked at today is a way of taking a Power BI application and making it easier to create a web test for your Power BI application and then being able to get all of the advantages of the web test. So also take away from this that web tests themselves are a lot more powerful than I think people give them credit for. So Phil is asking about Application Insights. Application Insights is positively a public, publicly available um, service from Azure. Matter of fact, I'm going to steal the screen away from my good friend Jeff, and I'm going to share the presentation I was just doing on VS Live. I actually walked through and was talking um, about how you can actually use the performance data that you get from Application Insights and optimize how big an instance are you paying for. So if you're paying and for a D-series virtual machine, do you need it? Yeah, and there are, I, I will say that there are some really good um, uh, training and uh, presentations up on Channel 9 on that very thing, as well as Pluralsight um, and some other places like that as well. App Insights is really good, um, but keep in mind that App Insights is in use after you've released or turned on things publicly, um, and you should be using a combination of tools, not just App Insights, but also um, your testing as well. And the testing and web test can be automated through VSTS. So with that, Jeff, I think we're at the top of the hour. Phil, I really appreciate you joining. I realize this is very, very far departure from my normal Power BI uh, content. We're going to go back to analyst-focused um, stuff. But again, I've been getting a lot of questions around premium capacities. How do I do capacity planning? And this is certainly one tool to be used in your tool belt. So Jeff, how do we find out more about uh, your blog, your information, and get the, getting this add-in that you built? The... Um the best thing to do is go to my website, which is just testinattack.com. And uh, if you've got some questions, I will. I do not have it posted up there yet, but by the end of the day today, I will have the um, sample code posted up there. And I will also send Charles a link, which you'll put up on the Power BI blog site. And if you've got um, any other questions, you can also reach out to me. My email is just Jeff G R G E O F F G R at testandattack.com. Or under the menu, you can go to, um, and I apparently can't see it here. Oh, let me close and accept. I thought I had it set up where you could send me an email through here, but apparently I don't see it on here right now. So just remember my email address is G E O F F G R at testandattack.com. All right, and the music says we're at the top of the hour. So you hang on, to um, Jeff. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the, the broadcast for everybody else. Otherwise, tomorrow we're back on model-driven applications using Power Apps. So um, back to the business analyst content and building some brand new type of applications. So thank you very much, guys.